I'm Gwyneth Paltrow, and you're listening to The Goop Podcast, made possible by our friends at New Balance. At Goop, we spend a lot of time thinking about ways to make everyday life a little bit easier, which is why we love New Balance's Fresh Foam Cruise Sneaker. You can sweat in and live in these shoes. Their sleek knit body and foam cushion supports delivery style and performance without skimping on comfort. In short, these sneakers work just as hard as you do. I'm partial to the gray, but you can check out all six color options at newbalance.com. Use code GOOP to receive free shipping through September 30th. Hi, guys. Every Thursday, Goop editors will be sitting down with provocative thinkers, industry disruptors, and culture changers. I'll take turns interviewing barrier-breaking guests as we talk about shifting old paradigms and starting new conversations. Today, I'm talking to the iconic Sarah Jessica Parker. I'm sure many of you first fell for her on Sex in the City, though she's just as brilliant as the star and executive producer of the HBO series Divorce. She currently serves as a vice chairman of the board of directors for the New York City Ballet. And she's a lifelong and voracious reader, one of the first people I call when I need a great book recommendation. Maybe why I love books so much is that they can transport you so much and you connect with people, you know, in ways that you, that are people that are different. In 2017, she launched a new fiction imprint called SJP for Hogarth. I loved getting a chance to catch up with Sarah Jessica this week. It's better for all of us to have disappointments in love, in profession, in, you know, friendships, in business. I just, I think everything means more. It means more when it, when it works. Now, let's get to my chat with Sarah Jessica Parker. Turning my Blackberry off. Everybody. I like That's that right, a, Blackberry. I like that you have a Blackberry. I, I, was, system. I was wondering what that <laughs> strange looking apparatus was. Can I see it? Oh my God, it's gorgeous. You know, I've never had anything but since 1999. I, I never was had same. I was like so Blackberry and then... This is amazing. So they finally married Android into the system. And they went back just now to with the this keyboard. one that came out like three weeks ago to this keyboard, the original keyboard. This, is, this was my thing. It's exquisite. Wow. I got so fast on Damn. this. and Yeah, you can do it with your eyes closed. It's amazing. It gets so much work done. Well, I'm All glad right. Apple's not sponsoring this podcast because then I'll be very upset. <laughs> How are you? I'm very well. I appreciate your hospitality. Well, thank you for coming. We've got a lovely cup of tea. From now on, I'm doing podcasts only in master suites. <laughs> <laughs> en suites. <laughs> yes. It's an en suite. Um, I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm so happy to get to talk to you. <laughs> this is very funny. I know. It's so, it is. It's like, especially in the beginning, it's like, like, if like, I was oh, doing hello. a scene opposite Matthew in a weird <laughs> way, do you know what I mean? We'll get past it. It's cool. You don't have to look at me sometimes if you don't want to. Okay. I can always look away. No, but it's so great to have you because, as you you know, I've been such a fan of yours, (laughs) both as a human being and as an actor for so long and everything you do. That's nice. And your style. (laughs) That's hilarious coming from you. It's true. Are you kidding? I think... um, I don't know. That must be. That must have been one out. Why you got to get out more? You got to <laughs> got to look at more people. No, see more people. <laughs> even just even what you're wearing today. I don't it's understand. Horrible. No, it's so cool. It's not. It's all old and no, junk. It's, it's so junk. great. It's I just got, like the layering of the necklaces and the no, cool sundress and no. the shirt. Yes, it's I junk. swear. I, oh, you can have all and of it. And the perfect highlights. What do you, I just you, don't know how you I do wish it. It's. I'm, I'm just holding up a mirror to you, oh. Gwyneth. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, <laughs> you're the vision. You're a no, vision. Okay, no, I think we're not been, going down this road. Okay, but before we before we make it right, um, I think there was like a proclamation even about you. So I don't. I mean, do you know Please, what I'm saying? No, we're yeah. not talking about. Okay, it. you're very kind and generous, and likewise. Thank you very much. Thank likewise. you. So you have been like you're so interesting to me when I look big picture at all you've accomplished and where you are in your life because you've been working so successfully for decades and you have all of these kind of incredible offshoot projects that are so cool and you've been married forever oh. these <laughs> but I'm just I you know so I'm about to get married again 
and Which so it's amazing. Thank you. I'm a little scared, but I'm 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 very optimistic I think about you it. You should be. I mean, I think I only reason the only reason I feel you probably should be optimistic is that you're a grown up woman and you're making a choice for entirely different reasons that people, I mean, perspective and life experience yeah. is, is everything. It informs everything. But I think the value of of you being a sophisticated woman and choosing marriage is promising. <laughs> Don't you think? Uh, yes. And I actually uh, really agree that when, you know, a lot of us get married young mm-hmm. and we are coming at it from like such a different or underdeveloped place mm-hmm. or... Um, and I think a lot of it is you really have to choose someone who is like going to be it's I mean, it's sort of like it's such a crazy game of chance because yeah. who knows what if you're going to grow in parallel, if your right. paths are going to diverge, what's yeah. going to happen. So I think like when I look at my friends like you who've had long marriages, especially now being a grown up going into one, I'm like, what are the things I'm trying to like, what are the things that keep people growing together? Like, what are the things, what are your observations about what, what happens that makes it work? And I mean, I'm not sure. Sometimes I'm not sure that any of my, I feel like I'm fairly lousy at, I think observation is a better word than advice or anything because all of our lives are so radically different. So I'm never certain that anything that I'm experiencing is like applicable to anybody else's life. Um, But I will say, I guess what I've learned or maybe what I've observed, and it's not that I'm always able or capable of remembering this in the moment when it matters most, is to kind of finally realize and settle at the things that don't matter, don't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, like exactly that. Like, and I think being irritated is like so great and it's so (laughs) satisfying and you can kind of scratch that itch so quickly and it can feel (laughs) really like brutal, even if you're not by nature someone who really enjoys brutality. Mm -hmm. But irritation, an irritant is not a reason. Like it, and I think what happens is that a cumulative thing about being irritated sort of like redirects. And so what I've learned, I think, in the recent past is like, eh, that doesn't actually matter. Yeah, it bothers me. But I also try to remember or think about how many things I do that must really bother him. You know, like I can imagine living with me. (laughs) And I think it's really um, miraculous, frankly, because I think, and I think the older I get, I'm probably more exacting and my expectations and, you know, with my, myself, my children, my husband, even friends and family, like you expect people, like time becomes more precious, um, time spent away from things you love doing, you know. So anyway, I try to remember how much I must, or I imagine how much how much I must annoy him. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you don't. No, I'm sure I do. I see it in his eyes. I know, but that it doesn't matter. Like I think we're now. Like I definitely want my future with him. Yeah. You know, I want to be someplace far away, and I love the time we're having now with our children. Mm-hmm. But I'm also excited about they will be off somewhere in the world, content you know, healthy, doing something interesting. And then he and I will be in another somewhere chapter else. And, yeah. It's you amazing. Know, yeah. I'm and I think that just means that you chose really well. Like but that's you, a crapshoot, man. Right. Because there were millions of others. <laughs> not I'm millions. not saying that there were millions that were like proposing. Oh, right. I'm just saying the world is vast. Like I could have yeah. come upon so many others as could you have. Yeah. So you, you stake your claim and you're like, all right, you know, you commit to this idea because it's an ideal too in the beginning. Yeah. And I think one other thing that I observe about it being the sage is that it's sort of, I realize that an intimate relationship with somebody is really like a study in everything that's wrong with you. 
<laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, definitely. And as you were saying, you can sort of convince yourself, like, ah, oh, this person is irritating. But it's right. like, well, why, why is that triggering? Like, right. what is, st- what am I projecting? Like, what is still not healed in me? Like, why? You know, and especially when I look back at some of my other boyfriends and I think, like, I was chasing a brick wall, you know? Yeah. But I feel like that's so important. I think it's great um, to have been wrong in love and um, been destroyed and heartbroken. And um, I just think it makes your what you imagine to be um, a life choice, you know, um, better. I think it, you know, everybody should date. Like if that's what you're mm-hmm. interested in and you should be wrong and um, you you should break some hearts and your heart should be broken and you should lay in bed in the old days next to a telephone looking at it, hoping it's going to ring <laughs> and be disappointed that it never does. Like, Why? Don't you, what do you love think that looking does? back at that? Don't you love having chased a brick wall? Because doesn't it make you, first of all, just I just think it makes you a more empathetic person. I think it, 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 it's better for all of us to have disappointments in love, in profession, in, you know, friendships, in business. I just, I think everything means more. It means more when it, when it works. Right. Like young girls are like, oh, you know, this awful, unthinkable heartbreak. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's the best. That's oh. the best. Because you... I don't know. You're better for having like accumulated some experiences. I think. I think you're absolutely right, and I'm going to keep that in mind when, because I always think, uh, when I look at my children, and you know, they're 12 and 14, and they're like in that oh. phase of life where everything is just it's a possibility. It's going to be unthinkably painful. And then when they, when that happens, I just, I think, oh, I won't be able to take it. No, it's hor- it's horrible. It's horrible. I mean, my son is only slightly older than your oldest, and has he had any kind of heartbreak? I don't know that he's had a heartbreak, but he's had disappointment. Like, how do he's, you uh, handle that? Like, how do you? I. Probably the same way, you know, the kind of the similar conversation we're having now. I first of all, I tell him that I think he's really lucky that his nature is resilience. Like he's that I think a lot of teenagers, which is what we see and we hear and we read about, is that I think a lot of teenagers um, are disappointed or heartbroken or or feel, you know, marginalized or not heard or seen, and they are quietly like in the saddle of sadness, disappointment, loneliness. And it feels acute, you know, when you're a teenager. And when James Wilkie, I think, has felt those things, which are, like, totally right, developmentally and everything, he feels it, and then he can kind of rally. And so I tell him when he's feeling that, I'm like, yeah, you should. It should feel awful, and it is awful, and it is disappointing. And I'm sorry she didn't see in you what you saw in her or that she couldn't see in you what I see in you right now. Um, But you will recover and it's and it's great. And you know how maybe you don't want to treat somebody in the future. Like maybe you won't ever choose to conduct yourself in the same way. But isn't it great that today you're fine in a way and or you're circumspect or you're philosophical. And it doesn't mean that you're not still like like. If you think of her or it, you're not just like, ugh. The hangover. Yeah, like, but yeah. you will be better, you know? For sure. So that's, that's what I tell him. That's great. I was driving up to your house once a couple of years ago to this house, and um, he shared with me a story, and he just burst into tears. We were, like, right pulling up to your driveway. And, and I was like, yeah, yeah. I could almost finish his sentence for him. And he was, you know— upset about something that was like legitimate to him but we had that same conversation and you know I don't even know if he'd recall that conversation today you know isn't it amazing though these building blocks that we are able to give our children you know we don't know what the impact we hope that the impact will be oh you know they'll step on this and use it to get to the next I hope stone and he's so lucky that he has a mother that's I mean your brain is so great I don't know Yes. I have, it's neurotic. It's but um, <laughs> but I feel like it's you know the same thing I hear from. I'm mostly I'm like looking at other mothers, my friends who have children who are slightly older or much older, mm. and trying to see what they did. Like yeah. 
why are their children basically well adjusted? Right. You know, do you find what a do common they do? thread? I think conversation um, is enormously helpful. As much as a teenager is willing to talk to you, I think that's hugely important. Yeah. You can't force it because nothing is worse. And I remember that really well, like feeling like allergic to my mother. Yeah. You know, um, but I think that's a large part. And I guess, too, and the thing that I think is the most difficult is being willing to not be liked. Right. Which is horrible. It's you know, terrible. Do you find that like when you have to be somebody that they don't like yeah. in order to help them be the better person? Yeah. And I find too that especially at this age, you know, Apple's 14, so I can't it. it's all happening. Yeah, man. And you know, sometimes her request, like the thing that would make her feel better is just something that's not appropriate. Like, yeah. I want to go be with my friends in uh, Los Angeles this week. I'm just sad, you know, everybody's together and yeah. I'm not there. And I'm like, I totally and completely understand that and yeah. how that feeling of missing out. Yeah. But we live yeah. here in the summer. Like, yeah. Not, you know, yeah. so some and then and even though what you're saying to them is the logical containing right, right thing to say, like to them, it's just poison. It's yeah. like you're saying something. And it's one that, more time that you're like limiting, you know. Yeah. And what, how, like, what's her response when, like, I mean, she's, her... to be honest, she's pretty good. She, she, she understands. And, but she, it's just this age is so interesting. I remember it. And it's like, they're 14, they're 15, but they're bursting out of their mm. skin. Like they just want to be 21, yeah. you know? And they and it's like, what, what the hell? So funny. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, what are we going to do with them until they're yeah. 21 and they feel like their agency has caught up to their feeling inside and yeah it's it's hard and I I also remember it so well and I think a girl is so I'm terrified of um, my daughter's being I'm so scared of it I saw um Apple in the car the other day we were passing each other it's the first time I've seen her since last summer and I was like I didn't for, actually I didn't recognize her at first and she said why is everybody saying that to me right now and I was like we don't recognize you I don't even get to see her that much but you know once a year like I see her she's around yeah. she's in and out of my house sometimes which is really nice and um I'm like wow what a difference between 11 and 12 12 and 13 13 and 14 that's been the biggest is like the 13 14 I mean she's taller than most of my friends now I know it's pretty crazy, but she seems nice. Like she just gave you a hug. She's nice. She really is nice. She's she's a great girl. She's Speaks really well of your she, parenting. I don't know. You know, I, I'm I, scared. I mean, you have, and one of yours is a real. She is like gonna run the world. I'm scared. I'm scared she's of Tabitha. Awesome. She. I mean, is, Tabitha. Yeah. I'm really scared. She's about. like fire and like strength and. But she's the. You mean the teeny one? Yes, yeah, the, the teeny one. one. With I know all it's that, the weirdest. She's weird. amazing. She, well, we'll. See. I mean, they no, I'm not scared. I, mean, I just want to clarify yeah. for anybody listening. <laughs> she's not scary. She's really um, strong. Yeah, I love that. It's it's great. But as a parent, Matthew and I are really. We. It's confounding. Like we're sometimes like, uh, do you, do you know what to do? <laughs> like no. And he's like, I can't beat her. I can't. We can't. We, there's no winning. And she's so strong. Like she's so, um, like she's so resolved. I I just never had that kind of confidence in a position. And she's mostly wrong, of course. But like I cannot believe the resolve. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, it's there's so much about that that's to be admired. And um, I think it can. It will serve her well as a grown-up, but it will also be, like, a challenge for her. Like, she's going to have to figure out how to... Um, Modulate it. Yeah, and, forgive people, yeah. <laughs> you know? and But I think it's actually great to start out from that place, especially if you have, like, really loving, conscientious parents who can help kind of guide your way and sort yeah. of... And I think there's something very special about this generation of girls. Like, yeah. Apple she's she's not fiery in that same way but she's really strong like she's incredibly grounded and and part of me just thinks we've ushered in this new mm -hmm. generation of girls who are incredibly strong in a way that I certainly wasn't yeah, like I was different. so riddled with 
insecurities and also operating under a much different societal laws, which I feel like have changed yeah. a lot lately. And changed at like such crucial times in their life, you know, for yeah. Apple to be witness to just the last six, eight, ten months. And even for nine-year-olds who are now like s- super alert, mm-hmm. it's a particularly it's amazing. amazing time to be a young woman. And and also figure out, you know, Apple, I think more more specifically than my daughters, but just like how they want to have those same conversations because it won't be the same as it is for us because they're la- it will be a second language to them. You know, we're like learning to, like we're learning a new language and how to talk to each other and listen and not unlike social media being so, they're so fluent yeah. in it, mm-hmm. but I think they have the opportunity to really mature the language, yeah. you know, the way all languages yeah. um, develop. Yeah. I wonder, I sometimes think about that, like, what is the impact of growing up as a girl right now with all, with culture changing so much and, you know, everything that's changed in the last year? Well, no, for a long time. Did you ever have anything like that happen to you? Uh, Yes. I mean, I did. And, and I think also so many other things happened so often in terms of just the way I was treated or, And and um, you just make a place in your life for it. Like, yeah. I cannot believe how many memories I am now having. They're not, like, made up or anything, and they're not – they are in no way can compete with some of the most harrowing or even the lesser harrowing stories that we've been hearing from women. Yeah. But I think tone and environments, not just on sound stages either, but in business, conversations that I've been having in business for a really long time – and it's not as if it's over. It's not as if, like, it was exposed to, like, a really powerful cleanser and everything's different because I still am in business meetings and I'm very surprised. Really? By the choice of language, the sort of diminishing. It's not intentional. It's, like, generational. Yeah. It's cultural. It's baked in. I also think of all the occasions that I just never said anything to anybody. Yeah. That you just, you, somewhat, I was thinking about this, it's the weirdest analogy, but I got sand in my eye once, and I went to the hospital to get it out because it's a horrible thing to have in your eye. And the doctor told me he got it out, and um, he didn't. And I had to go, we got in the car, and I was like, Matthew, it's still in my eye, but I'm so scared to tell him, and I'm so embarrassed, and I feel bad because he feel, felt like really victorious. But then I went back, and the reason I went back was because he told me that the reason sand is dangerous, and maybe this isn't true, is that your eye is, like, really adaptive. Like, your eye is a host, and it will kind of just create space, and it will just be a sort of mildly irritating, very unpleasant, but it... And I was like, well, that's what this is like. It's like, oh, I was a host for, like, experiences that were upsetting or they made me feel bad or I didn't feel listened to over and over, even though I was kind of in charge. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. um, and I got you, I just kind of made it okay. Cause I also didn't want to be difficult. I didn't want to be right. thought of as, you know, a diva or all those things that we, even as children of, of mothers who like were on the front lines in the women's movement, and thought we didn't have that we I thought I inherited all that like right. I could be everything I could have it all I could do this and this and this and this and it's not true mm. long answer to a short yeah. question no, it's really fascinating though I always think it's so interesting when you have like something like sex in the city that is like so seminal for the culture like it can't even be measured and <laughs> god I remember I was in London doing a movie it had to this has to be like 2001 when did it come out when did when was that first season it's 20 years this June so uh, 1998 okay so it did be yeah. 2000 yeah and I had <laughs> My agent, like, FedEx me the VHSs really? of Sex and the City. And it was, like, getting me through this, oh. like, a breakup oh. and, you oh. know, this bad movie experience and everything. No. Why do you think it was so resonant? Like, was it the time where it was it sort of each... I always thought, like, oh, each of these women is, like, representing an aspect of yeah. women. And we're not allowed to right now be all these things at once. Like, right. we're not allowed to, like, sex and be intellectual and right. be, like, a proper lady. Right, 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 right. And yeah. 
right? And so and yeah, a professional. They were woman. all archetypes, right? And I do. I think I'm. I'm kind of. I'm kind of lousy at understanding its place, or, or even even why it. You know, people had strong connections, and some were negative, strong connections to the show. But probably in large part, if I'm forced to, like, ponder it, I would say it is probably in large part um, because it was so um, specifically offering points of view. And and I think that was one of the more clever conceits and commitments of the show, initially by Darren and then obviously by Michael Patrick King, was that, you know, Carrie was this... She was experiencing in those columns, she was sort of creating these stories, but you could count on Samantha, Miranda, and Charlotte for a point of view. And I think people right. really loved that and that they could find a place in one another's lives. So the second part of it, I think, was those friendships, you know, the intimacy of the friendships, the sort of more um, honest portrait of friendships when they're good and when they're bad, you know, when they're betraying each other and when they're really supportive and g- good to each other, when they're reliant upon with, on, on one another in mm-hmm. ways that's inspiring and familiar. And I think just the really candid nature of the dialogue was just something that perhaps um, women were experiencing in their own lives, but they'd never seen it in cinema They'd never seen those relationships that they either were having or were wanting to have. Mm. And so I think, you know, the love stories are are special. And I think, you know, Carrie and Big and all that was, you know, you can get swept away in that. And I, too, you know, love those kinds of stories. And obviously the clothes were thrilling. And Pat- Patricia Fields yeah. was telling stories with clothing and in new ways. It's probably the friendships, those friendships, that intimacy on screen Mm -hmm. that I think people really connected to. Yeah, because intimacy is hard in life to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes even it's it's easier in women-friend relationships than it can be sometimes even in, like, intimate relationships. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the the quality of the friendships, there was something really just – Un, we had never seen anything like yeah. that, you know. Yeah. So it was really. And then you did you have James Wilkie while you were? Were um, you pregnant during? I remember. I was pregnant during. Um, let's see, he was born in in two thousand two. So yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. Of course I did. Yeah. Um, How did it, you manage that? We shortened the sixth season. I think we we went on a hiatus. I, I had terrible morning sickness. I got really, really sick. I mean, I was fine, but except I couldn't stop vomiting. Right. So we shut down for a while. We tried to not. Right. And it was like, not. it was like bad acting, like, you know, <laughs> action. I, uh, um, so we went on a little hiatus and they got me to my fourth month and the doctor felt really confident that by then I would Something feel better. Right. Yeah. And then about Four weeks after I got pregnant, Cynthia Nixon got pregnant. So we were pregnant oh, at the same time I with did. our sons, her son Charlie and my son James Wilkie. Um, and so it worked out kind of well for everybody. And so then when we came back, I shot up until – we shot up until um, June or July. And James Wilkie was born in October. So, you know, I was pretty far along, and we just did versions of hiding it. But, you, I mean, it wasn't hidden at all. Right. I, I think it's – when I – see any images I'm like well that I'm just surprised we thought we were <laughs> getting away it. with it yeah and then I had a few months off and we went back to work he was supposed to be born in November and he was born in October and I think we went back to work like right after New Year's so I had oh, a, wow. a nice a nice amount of time more more time off than a lot of working women yeah and how do you how have you continued like since that day I feel like your work life is so robust and so interesting, and don't you? I mean, um, you have all these fantastic. I mean, no more, no more than yours, definitely. <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, I, I like you know what you've what you've done. You've you've grown this crazy business, right? You are also giving other people opportunities for work. You know, um, I don't even know how many women. How many women are working with you now? Let's see. We're we're about two hundred in total, and I think probably ten percent are men at this point. That's so. unbelievable. It's very That's gratifying. Incredible. It's really amazing. I mean, those numbers are like the beyond the ideal right now for um, workplace diversity. Those are amazing, crazy <laughs> good numbers. But I think also you're probably giving a lot of women a, a job and a place to spend time that they like. 
Well, that's, you know? I think that's, that's something that I'm really proud of. And I, I think that, you know, the, the women who work at Goop and the men too, but the women who are there, the feedback that I get is that they feel, they love their jobs. They love the, the community. And it's just amazing. It's such a, I can't even articulate how it makes me feel when I look around sometimes when we have these like all hands meetings with everyone. And I think, my gosh, like all of these people, it yeah, it's just, it's incredible. So what is the day like, what, well, do, like take out the summer. Cause I know that kind of changes everything. And I know, and, and pretend you're not on a movie, like take out the things that get in the way of your work at Goop. Mm-hmm. Like how, how, how do you like it or how does it best function for you to run it, keep it moving, um, all the things that are required to run a business. Like, how do you how do you do it? What's a what's a week or what's a day? I mean, I know I know, I know every day is different. But having said that, not really. I mean, I go to the office every day. I drop my kids. I exercise and I go to work. And you know, the really fascinating thing about the job is that like the breadth of my responsibilities is pretty wide. So, I've had to learn such an insane amount. I mean, the learning curve has been so steep. I, I didn't go to business school. Yeah. I didn't study accounting. I Isn't hate fucking part, Excel. Like I can't, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. I have to take all of my focus to get through an Excel spreadsheet and to have to understand and manage a P&L and the culture yeah. and the relationships between executives and to create product and it's just it's it's amazing i mean it's the most gratifying job i've ever had i can't figure out why none of it makes like (laughs) people are like why do you like it so much and maybe and and the other thing i want to ask you about um too is because i know you you have many opportunities with either a pop-up shop or you know an actual place where people can be in a room with product is do you like being in a store because I really like being in the store too I love being in the store why too. well I, I want to hear why you like it because people are always like but why why do you like it I love it because to me it's a physical manifestation of all the millions of things that I and my team do every yeah. day like it's the call it's a physical culmination and manifestation of yeah. all our hard work yeah so whether it's a product that we made that's there whether it's like the, the salesperson really understanding like what the values of the company yep. are and he or she is able to articulate that. Yep. It's the community of the people in the store. It's, you know, the what it's everything that's gone into it. And then you're standing in there. I mean, it's crazy that our first permanent store we opened at the Brentwood Country Mart in Los Angeles mm-hmm. uh, almost a year ago. And the physical location of this store is was the candy store that I used to walk to in elementary school every on the weekends with Mary Wigmore, and it's like now I have a store. Isn't that so crazy? <laughs> so it's very surreal. And don't you like knowing where everything is in the store, and you could do it all, and you know, even though like the point of sales, like just trying to get that all. Like I love, like I love. You know, checking a customer out. It's like, so great. Do you do know. that? I, I do that too. I love it. It's so fun. I love it. And I also, I'm just wondering, there's so, I mean, there's so many you and friends of ours and millions of women who we don't know, but who didn't go to business school, who didn't, um, actually, I always thought I was bad at math. I did so poorly on my PSATs in math. I, Math, you know, gave me a stomach ache. I would vomit before a test. I'd be so anxious about math, you know. And I'm wonder, you know, I just think it's so interesting that I, w- I wish I could tell more women that business actually isn't about math. Right. It's actually not about that. It's about human beings. It's about collaboration and um, and risk taking and being really smart and strategic and thoughtful and careful and then not being careful right. and having huge dreams. And you can get somebody who can actually sort out the Excel and actually can do sales and, you know, have those conversations that are necessary with warehouses or production. But I feel like it gets in the way of a lot of women because it seems scary. And I think you and I were given these opportunities or created them be, because we weren't asked to follow the same business model right we didn't have to prove to somebody that we could handle a business which is an enormous privilege and the other thing I think that's great about it about a store in particular is that um in when you're an actor 
you know, if you've get if you were fortunate to be part of anything that people connected with and you have a million of those experiences, it's not typical that anyone will ever be able to talk to you about what it meant, you know. Yeah. You can go to a premiere and shake as many hands as you can in the limited amount of time. But, And I guess social media has given some, like it's been a remedy of sorts. Like you can say thank you, you can talk to people. But being in a store, on the floor, with a customer, is like, is been the most perfect opportunity to convey gratitude. Like all of it's about them. I wouldn't have a business if I didn't have this experience on television for you know, 10 or 12 years, it would never have happened. It was their investment in me, you know? So they're part of the design process. They're part of every decision I make. When I, you know, think about that gang of 10 million women or however many it was at our best moment, I feel like, oh, now I can say to them, thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, am I doing right by you? What else do you need versus what do you want, you know? Or and what do you want versus what do you need? We'll have more of Sarah Jessica Parker in a minute. In the meantime, let's talk about one of our partners. We take a holistic approach to content at Goop, covering food, beauty, wellness, style, and more. We try to make small choices count, like making the most of what you choose to put on your body. New Balance is on the same page. Their fresh foam cruise sneakers are designed to be versatile and simple to slide into, They also have incredibly comfortable foam cushioning, as well as an engineered knit body. They're so breathable and light, it almost feels like you're wearing nothing at all. The best part, you can slip them on with leggings for a workout class, but they also look pretty great with jeans when you're jumping into a meeting or heading for school pickup. We work hard at Goop to curate the best of everything out there to be sure that every piece, whether it's a blazer, an evening dress, or a pair of sneakers, is your first choice when you're getting dressed. The first choice, whether you're going from the office to dinner or from the gym to running errands. Check out the Fresh Foam Cruise Sneaker for yourself at newbalance.com. Use code GOOP at checkout to receive free shipping through September 30th. Hi, this is Elise, the Chief Content Officer here at Goop. I was obsessed with magazines growing up. W, Interview, Vogue. I don't want to age myself here, but there was no social media. This was really sort of my only window into the world growing up in Montana. I put tear sheets all over my walls. I obsessed over magazines. And I thought that the magazine world was something I couldn't touch. But I got a break after college and started a career at Lucky. And that career primarily consisted of packing boxes and checking in clothing samples and getting coffee. And that was all fine with me. Eventually, I became an editor. Fast forward to Goop many, many years later. A lot of what we do is obviously digital, but it was a dream come true to be able to create a print version of Goop, complete with food, culture, style, and wellness, concepts similar to what we do on the website, but a totally different format when you're holding it in your hands as a magazine. Our third issue of Goop Magazine is coming out soon. It's my favorite so far, stunning and full of fascinating deep dives, delicious recipes, indispensable travel advice, and really beautiful fashion. I'm also really excited because for the first time, we are offering a magazine subscription. We'll send you four issues of the magazine right to your door. And as a thank you for signing up, We're also going to give you an amazing gift, a mini exfoliating instant facial, which is a bestseller in Goop. We literally cannot keep it in stock and a five pack of Goop Glow, which is a skin super powder that you can drop right into your water. I drink mine every morning at the gym. To get this great gift and the magazine, go to goopmagazine.com. Okay, let's get back to our chat with Sarah Jessica Parker. Have you always loved shoes? I've always loved them, but not in the way that Carrie Bradshaw (laughs) loved them. Because I didn't know that you could even love shoes. I didn't know that you could... I didn't know you could love shoes and then have them. You know, we grew up in... um, We had... There was this great shoe store. When I was living in Cincinnati, 
there was a shoe store in this place called Kenwood, which was a pretty serious drive from our neighborhood. But we went twice a year. We went, like, at the end of August for our school shoes for the year. And then we would go, we would get, like, you know, um, fall, winter shoes and then spring, summer shoes. So we got two pairs of shoes a year. And then we had a married pair of Mary Janes, proper Mary Janes. Um, but if my sister outgrew hers, then I would just get my sisters. So we drove to this shoe store that was beautiful and it sold Buster Brown shoes primarily. And this is once again, a very long answer to a short question, (laughs) but it's kind of material to the question, but I would go in the shoe store and I'm one of eight kids. And at that time I was probably one of six kids and they would fit all of us at different times. And you'd be left on your own in this shoe store until it was your turn to be fit. And, um, I would walk around First of all, it was air conditioned in the summer, which was like heaven, <laughs> and warm in the winter, which was like heaven. It smelled so good. It smelled like, because in those days, you know, there weren't anything but leather, basically leather shoes. Doesn't, didn't matter how much money you had. There weren't the Targets of the world and the Walmarts. Like you, there were mom and pop independently owned shoe stores, you know. And I would like pick up I really would pick up all the shoes and I would like smell them and I would look at the stitching on the soles. I would look at the sock liners. I would fantasize knowing full well what shoe my mom was going to make me get. But there was like, they were beautiful. It smelled so incredible. And I loved my new shoes. Like I really, even if they weren't the shoes I wanted, I loved a new pair of shoes. And I didn't, like, obsess over it. It, it, Once we were gone, I never thought about it again. But we also had to um, clean our own shoes every Sunday. My mom got out newspaper, and every Sunday she got out the Kiwi shoe polish. And we were all lined up, and we had to polish our own shoes every Sunday to keep them, you know, as nice as we could because we weren't getting another pair. Yeah. But I, lo- I did love those shoes, and they were beautifully made shoes. You know, they were like Buster Brown and occasionally Stride Right, but primarily Buster Brown. For some reason, this story is making me like on the verge of tears. <laughs> I don't mean it to be. It's um, it's a really happy memory. <laughs> no, it's very. There's something. It's like there are so many elements of that story that I just find so moving. Did you have Did you have a shoe store you went to? We would go, yeah, there was somewhere, when I was really little, I remember going, when I was really little, we were in California, and there was somewhere on Wilshire, and we would go yeah, get our yeah, school yeah. shoes, too. And then eventually, maybe we got, a, we got a pair of sneakers, but we weren't, I wasn't yeah. wearing sneakers for a long time. So that was not an option. Wow. The only other, like, shoe accessory in our house was the dreaded um, the boot that went over your shoe, <laughs> okay. which was horrifying. But we all wore it, so it's not I wasn't alone. But even then, I was like, "This is not." There's a good something look. wrong about. There's something <laughs> awful about this. And in Ohio, in the winters in Ohio, and it wasn't lined or anything. It was just heavy rubber, and it had like a frog on it. You know, so you would. Mm-hmm. It sort of had a, a, a pleat. So you pulled it over your own massive shoe already. So picture how big this boot was. And they came in three colors. You know, a sort of deep barn red, oh a white, which was destroyed and hideous within days. Right, of course. And like a, probably a navy, which all, in my opinion, incredibly depressing colors. Yeah. You pulled it over your own shoe. And then, it, and then because it had to fit, it, it had this pleat, right, so that it could fit over. Right. But then you took this frog, and you're, some of your listeners will recall this, and you could close it up somewhat. So it looked like pretty. It would like overlapped and closed with like a proper frog, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing. It flapped back and forth. As you mm. took steps, it was big. Oh. And it hurt. Like in the dead winters of an Ohio Midwestern oh. winters, it was brutal. So we, and we were not allowed to wear pants in my family. The girls were not allowed to wear pants. Even in winter? No, just tight. Just tights. tights. Wow. Do you remember tights? I do. I, I still sort of like tights. I love tights, but they're not the same as they were then. Yeah, they were they pretty were woolly. They were thick and woolly. Yeah, and they weren't great. A blend that hadn't been worked <laughs> out yet. So are we not bringing back the frog overboot in the SGP? No, I mean, see, here's the thing. Like, I, everything my mom did, I'm now in complete accordance with. I'm like, she was right about everything. <laughs> she was right about everything. If I could get those freaking boots on my kids in the winter, I would love nothing more to see them, like, walking off to school in those uh, boots. They were darling. You know what they were? They were the boots that Christopher Robin wears, basically. Right. If you see those illustrations, 
Yep. And look how I cute. Know. He, I, yeah. Darling, charming. <laughs> I love these the sh- the history of shoes. This is like <laughs> so so it makes sense. And then so when you started playing someone with this obsession with shoes, and then you were so known for shoes, and then we were all so hyper focused on your shoes, which we still are, by the way. <laughs> was it just kind of like did somebody approach you and say, "Hey, we think that yeah. there's some real synergy here. Like there's a business <laughs> yeah. to be made." They did, and I. Um you know, I really tried to say yes. They, they I, I kept, I, I, yeah, a lot, it was really, it was, wasn't right when the show ended or even during the show. It was some, some time had passed. And I think it's too, because the show ended in James Wilkie was like, he was a year and a half old. So 2004. So if you go back in time, you think about people weren't really pursuing businesses, right? Mm-hmm. There were people in the beauty business and there were people in fragrance in terms of actors and um, public figures. Um, so this idea of, a, of being in the shoe category wasn't – I think it took people a while because that just wasn't happening in the world, you know? So uh, a while after the show ended and I think even after I did the second movie, a bunch of companies were asking if I would consider going into business with them. And um, it was very exciting and I was very flattered and I I had lots of very interesting meetings you know, with like big shoe people, right? But they all wanted me to make the shoes in China mm-hmm. and sell them for, you know, $69, $99. Mm-hmm. And those margins were incredibly seductive for everybody. And it just meant like, we were going to all be rich, you know? And um, and I just kept having the hardest time saying yes. And much to the chagrin of my agents who were like, this is a crazy deal, or this one's going to be a better deal, or this. Finally, I went to lunch one day, and I was with some women who I didn't know well, but they were all really successful business women, like running proper businesses, CEOs of businesses, businesses they had built or founded or, you know, been brought into. Um, and we were talking about stuff, and they they said, you know, the shoe category came up, and I was like, I'm just having a, And one of them said to me, well, what do you want to do? And I said, what I really would love to do is to go into business with George Malcolmus III, but he's already spoken for. You know, he's the CEO of Manolo, and he brought Manolo to this country 40-some years ago and built that business. But he's busy, you know, because all of his shoes, you know, he makes his shoes in Italy. And I felt like I, if I could figure out a business model that we could get the price point down. And they were like, have you asked him? And I was like, no, I, I'm i not going to ask. I'm not going to put him in that position. And they said, just call him. So I left the lunch. It was at St. Ambrose. I walked half a block home, and I got a phone, and I went outside, and I called George. And I was like, George, I know this is a long shot, but would you ever consider going into business with me? And he's like, be at my office tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. And I was, and... Amazing. We wanted all the same things. And he had been wanting to do a shoe in Italy, different price point. We both realized we came to New York this, maybe the same month, the same year. We had all the same influences in shoes, you know, Maud Frison and Charles Jordan and um, Walter Steiger, like all those greats, you know. There were all these great shoe stores on 57th Street in the 70s and the early 80s. And, yeah, so we started this business. And it's been amazing. It's been amazing. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Do you have a prep? Like, I know it's sort of like saying, which is your favorite child, (laughs) but like you have these incredible fragrances. You have your shoe business. You have your acting career. You produce, Mm -hmm. you produce, you're Mm -hmm. right? A creator, producer. We have a company at HBO, yeah. Company at HBO. Mm -hmm. And now you have this imprint, which I want to talk to you about. So, are you as equally in love with all of these different I businesses? I am. I, I thought I, you would I, be. I, I, I'm, I'm sure it's like, you know, what you're doing. Um, when I'm doing whatever it is I'm doing, it's the thing I love most in the world. I mean, nothing, nothing, acting at is at its best in, in those those a handful of minutes when you're actually getting to act, when the camera is rolling and it feels good and you're – with an amazing actor playing opposite or in a scene and the writing is you know those moments where it's like what I imagine it must feel like to be a baseball player when you hit the ball exactly as you intended nothing competes with that I really and to this day I really feel that way and the same for stage you know when you're working on stage and it just 
feels right. Those occasions are harder to find, and, and, and they feel much more elusive. Yeah. So nothing feels like that acting at its best. But I love working in publishing because I love books, and I love reading so much, and I have my whole life, and I love the it's fragrance business. It's such a fundamental part of you. Like, I always... Yeah. Yeah, it's You definitely... always have a book. You're always... <laughs> and the way you describe books... I remember once I was asking you about The Goldfinch, oh which God. I was about to start reading. Oh, my God. And I had loved The Secret History, of yes, course. Yes. And I was like, I was sort of had trepidation about even starting it because I was like, nothing's going to be as good exactly. as The Secret yeah, History. Yeah. yeah. And I, and, and you were like, I, you, you were so, it was so visceral the way you were like inhabited by the love. And you were like, oh my God, I I'm so jealous. I think about Theodore Decker every day. <laughs> I still do. It's really weird. Wow. And, and not, I swear this is not to just talk about this book right here, Place for Us. But I will say one of the things, one of the many great experiences of, of reading this book by this extraordinary young debut novelist is that there's a character in that that I think about now as much as I think about Theodore oh, Decker. Interesting. And I think that's like maybe why I love books so much is that they take you so far. They, they can transport you so much and you can, I think you can, you can connect with people, you know, in ways that you, that are people that are different. And that's mm-hmm. different than, you know, talking about literary fiction, but to care so deeply about a character that's merely a figment, figment of an author's imagination, I think is just such an achievement, you know, by the author. How did you find this woman? Just for a little background, the imprint is, it's called SJP for Hogarth, and it's within the Hogarth imprint. And Hogarth is an imprint that was started by Virginia Woolf and her husband in Richmond um, in England. And it was this really well thought of publishing house. They primarily published Friends, but they didn't just publish. They actually created the books. They made the books, she and her husband. And it was really quite something and published some really important books. And and then it sort of went through this fallow period and um, a company in the UK brought it back to life. And then Molly Stern, who's sort of my boss at Crown, but she's also Penguin Random House and all these other imprints. Um, she's the publisher there. She partnered with the UK and they started the um, United States, sort of North America version of Hogarth. It's, it's, its history is obviously something I admire, but it's also an imprint that publishes primarily literary fiction, which is like my favorite, favorite genre of fiction. And um, so when we announced my imprint inside Hogarth, um, we went we met all these agents and it was very nervous making. And, you know, soon after um, submissions started coming in, there were some that weren't right for us. And there were some three to be specific that I loved and lost and had a feeling I would because they went to established, you know, imprints and very faint, fancy, you know, um, legendary imprints. And I understood that and actually would have suspected as much. But this manuscript came in and um, Fatima's manuscript. And within, I don't know, 40 minutes of reading it, I I recognized that, that this she was a very important new powerful american voice like i i knew it i didn't think we were going to get this and i was afraid we weren't but i also i also thought if i can just plead my case you know if i can make the best play possible if i can just speak to the author a little bit to explain why i felt i could do right by her why i could you know why i wanted to shepherd this book and also just introduce her as a writer um that maybe that we she would at least consider us in that short you know in the as the list as the names became fewer and fewer and we were just enormously fortunate that um after conversations she she chose us and she chose me and the interesting thing about that was that she's with the Wiley agency which is a very old new york prestigious like mythical literary agency and and when I when we announced the imprint my first meeting was with Andrew Wiley and it was I was like are you freaking kidding me of all people why do I have to go with like nothing planned yet like I hadn't worked on 
I didn't have any. You didn't any, have the pitch I down. didn't have the pitch at all. And I was terrified of him only because I admire him so freaking much. <laughs> and he's on 57th Street. Like, he's, it's the office that you can imagine. It's like sort of... Like, you can imagine, it's like mid-century furniture and books on a thing, and he's over... But it's it's a modest, like, super chic office with, like, you know, titles of books that we've all read and known our entire freaking life. But anyway, Fatima is with the Wiley Agency. So anyway, yeah, we got this extraordinary book, and it's been an absolute thrill to witness this, the success of this book. It, it debuted it? number 12. It debuted number You're 12 kidding. on the New York Times bestseller list oh last God. week. It's sharing the 12th spot with another book that I love called There, There by Tommy Orange, which is a an incredible book about um, Native Americans in Oakland, California. It's it's really quite something. How and many? they've become writer friends. Oh, they have? Yeah. Um, hey, but for number literary 12. fiction, yeah. Come but for coffee. literary fiction, I will say, to sit on the New York Times bestseller list is Extraordinary. Highly irregular. Yeah. It's the coolest. Congratulations. Yeah, so she'll always have that sticker on her book. So tell tell me quickly what it's about. Or not quickly, so, but you um, know. Yeah, I'll do my best. Cliff um, note me. Okay, listen, it's a book about an American family in all its plurality. And by that I mean it's a book about a Muslim American family. The parents have arrived here. They were immigrants. They've come to Northern California. They're married. It's an arranged marriage. They arrive. This is a work of fiction. And they they start a family in Northern California. And um, and it's a it, it it's the book opens at the wedding of the oldest daughter Hadia, and they are about to take the portrait, the family portrait, which is a tradition in um, in Indian Muslim families, that there is a moment in the wed- in a wedding where a portrait of a family is taken. And um, it's, it's a tradition, and it's um, a portrait that will hang on the family's wall forever. And they are waiting for the only son, the estranged son, Amar. Hadia is very close to her youngest brother, the only brother in the family. He's the youngest. And they're not sure if he's going to show up. And that's how the book opens. And you travel with this family backwards and forwards in time to hear their story, their singular story of their life in Northern California as immigrants and Americans. Um, It happens to span the period of September 11th, 2001, which is interesting, obviously, for a Muslim American family. And it is it is a breathtaking in scope, deeply moving, heartbreaking, incredibly perfectly observed, bizarrely observed. The writer is 26 years old. Oh, my gosh. Um, she just graduated from the Iowa Writers Workshop when she finished this manuscript. But it is a beautiful book about a family. And whether or not it's a family you relate to um, because of their ideology or because they are observant in ways that we aren't all in our own lives. The connections, the missed opportunities, the sense of um, honor that we feel about those that raise us, that make sacrifices for us, how hard it's also about how hard we all try to find our own place in the world, you know, and still remain loyal and good to those who gave to us, Mm -hmm. you know, parents, how to be a person of faith in your own way and still honor others that might be you know, more observant or are more conventionally observant. Um, But it's an incredibly easy read in terms of, like, I'm I'm making it sound like an academic, but like paper, but it's not. It's a... And it's amazing. Like, it's resonating with so many readers. And the reviews have been crazy. I'm so happy for you. Yeah, I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud, and I'm so excited about her future. And especially the timing is, I feel fortuitous like it really is a book for our times that wasn't its intention Mm. but it's you know literary fiction I think is often about global voices and that's why I'm interested in it primarily because I feel like it's an opportunity for us to know one another better you know it's often about books about people far away that don't look familiar or smell familiar lands that are feel very foreign to us ideologies cultures and and in the best most capable hands you really can connect to people who are wonderfully different than us 
That's incredible. Do you know what your next one is? I do. Our next book um, will publish in January, and it's by um, it's written by an amazing, another amazingly gifted female writer. Her name is Claire Adam, and she um, was born and raised in Trinidad and Tobago. And it's the story of um, a father's choice that he has to make, and it's incredible. It's beautiful and. You know, it's about scarcity and economy and class and the things we do because we feel they're best and right and often, you know, how those aren't the right good decisions. Those aren't the fruitful decisions, and it's incredible. I can't yeah. wait to read that one. Yeah. Too. It's called um, called Golden Child. Okay. How many – What is what percentage of your day are you reading, do you think? It depends. I think I read – I read more in New York than I read here for some reason. Um, I think because I'm on the subway more in New York or I'm working more in New York, so I plan, I try to plan ways to read. Um, when I'm on the set, I read all the time. Right. It's the best place, I think, to read, even though I think people would think that's weird. But I mean, they, they would think it's not helpful concentration wise, you know? But I find oh, it very helpful. I think so too. Anything that's sort of opening up that channel of emotion and creativity yeah. and I think it keeps you can keep you focused strangely enough because yeah. there's so much chatter but I it's different it depends if I have to read which isn't usually hard to do but um it depends I read as much as I can but I've also like become very interested I kind of obsessed with podcasts so I feel like that's yeah. really cut into my reading time I feel kind of bad saying that no but I think they're they're very worthwhile as well I've yeah. gotten very into them too what, what do you listen to I'm trying to hear like I what you're. I listen to hearing. like nerdy. I listen. There's a, a good Harvard Business Review podcast that I like a lot. <gasps> wow. And they have some really good like varying in length little class kind wow. of type podcasts that are really good. I listen to the Goop podcast, of course, because my uh, my Elise Lunin, my chief content officer, does most of them, and she's so brilliant. And I just I love her questions, and I Great. I learn so much when I. And then I listen to Pod Saves America. Oh, yeah. Pod, Pod Saves America. America. Great. Great. I like business podcasts. Like, yeah, this is really embarrassing, but Goldman Sachs actually has a really wow. a good one where they have great people on. I always wow. love to hear about what other people in business are thinking about yeah. and worrying about. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Business of Fashion actually is a really interesting podcast. Mm. You can listen to different CEOs. Um, wow. So I've, I think I'm just sort of... I like listening to things that are really applicable, like right. that I there's right. a takeaway, yeah, yeah, as yeah. opposed to like daydreamy Just, like, kind of. Yeah. yeah. Do you watch any terrible like reality TV shows or anything? Well, I watch um, House Hunters International all the time, but then the other night I I couldn't watch the news, which is really hard for me. I know you're such a New York Times reader, and a, but it's all it's. I feel so. Ugh, let's not talk right about now. it. So anyway, I stumbled across a show. Which I cannot believe exists. And when I've seen the title <laughs> in the past and I've moved past it, I thought it was one thing. But I watched like three episodes back to back and it's called Naked and Afraid. Oh, I've seen that one. It's so bizarre. I, it's, I didn't it's know crazy. it's just two. Each episode <laughs> is just two. And that they find the worst possible places in the world. They're like Panama you know, monsoon season. <laughs> it was, cr- but I watched three in a row. And they lose like 40 pounds. Oh, and they have like a, um, they have a score at the end. It's called your, 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 you survival know. Survival something. Yeah, your something yeah. survival. I've seen P- that a couple your times. Your PSO or something. I don't know what it means. <laughs> now I forget what it means. But it's like, then I was like, oh, a lot of, it's a lot of people who have um, served in the military. That makes sense, that they're so good at yeah. extreme circumstances and also just at sacrifice. Like, they're not, they don't need to be, to feel safe and cozy all the time because they're in constant state of conflict and front lines. Right. And I was like, could I, like, fantasize? I can't. So I, I, I watched that, but I don't really watch any other reality. No. TV. I used to watch years and years ago. I watched Housewives. I haven't watched that in years. I've um, never seen what, one of those. Reality sh- oh, really? I just found one what? last week. What? Oh my Wait, what is god! It? It's called Doctor Pimple Popper. Oh, I, I can't watch it. I can't. My friend Jill loves it. 
Do you like it? I'm so traumatized slash obsessed with this. <laughs> I was just talking about it with James Wilkie this morning. It's I was crazy. like, I saying there's a show on Apple, and I watched it last night in what my did bed. What did you guys think? What did she think? I mean, I there's no, there are no words. I don't even know what to say. It is so. I, I genuinely can't even begin to articulate my feeling about it, but I want to watch another one, like right now. It's so disturbing. So I don't understand the whole show. She's just she's just taking t- care of people. She's zits. take no, it, but it's like giant oh God, fat think, tumors oh and like squeezing boils. Oh God! I think about that. <laughs> oh my God! Oh God! It's so crazy, and she's oh the God. nicest doctor. She's like, well, you'd have to be. She's awesome. Oh, I, I want to be sure friends like with this woman. Hero. I'm sure she's changing people's lives. You can't believe it. Of... Oh it's, God! I know. Why do I? Why am I? No, no, no! You're not alone. Why my best I... friend. My best friend goes on holiday. She, we go she's on holiday. She's into Doctor Pimple Popper. She's been doing secretly. She just revealed to me. She's like, I have to tell you something. I, when I'm with you sometimes, and you say to me, "What are you doing on your phone?" She's on YouTube watching yeah. some. It started as a YouTube channel. This is what I just right, learned. Right. And she has like a million followers, yes. and it's all her squeezing things oh out God. of. Her. <laughs> oh my God. I don't know why it bothers me so much. Like, I don't have a weak stomach. I don't. Please just but don't you know, it's watch like either this. for you, you know, like it, the world sep- like it just separates. Like, it creates, like, you either can watch it or you can't. I don't think there's any in between. No, there's not. Know? Especially not this one. But I do, it sort of struck me because I've never been a reality television person yeah, yeah. and I and I think now because everything feels so chaotic in the yeah. world and and then also you know so much work and yeah. teenagers and all this brain to, oh my god it's yeah. like it takes you so out of your well if you don't want I mean if you want a slight like if you want a, another option <laughs> you should just watch House Hunters International it's Fine. the greatest it's the greatest I think I've seen I think it's I've seen great. the English version of this it's fantastic Okay, fine. And then the other day also, um, I did watch like a very old episode of, you know, the Great British Bake Off or Baking oh, yeah. Show. And that's wonderful. Yeah, people love that. Oh I've my never God. seen that one. I think you would love it. Wait, before we end, because yeah, I don't yeah, want to yeah. keep you here all day. That's okay. Can you, the can same I? Fitbit, but I didn't wear mine. I've gotten really into this Fitbit. Me too. I know, I like this one I love too. love my Fitbit. Me too. And my friends are like astonished. They're like, what is that on your wrist? I was like, this months and months ago, I started wearing it. I was like, it's a Fitbit. And they're like, what? <laughs> it's like, it's a but, Fitbit. But then in New York, like when you walk around New York it's City. The best. When those fireworks go off at 10, like, they, like you know, that yeah, buzz you get at 10,000. 10, I know. Like nobody celebrates me like that ever. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. When I'm running up the stairs again to get a child's thing, another thing, another thing for a child, and for the a thing. And fireworks go off. And then you're like, that little buzz. You get like a and you're like, Would look you down. ever live anywhere but New York City? Nah. I mean, we want to move. We actually, we. I want to leave. <laughs> so you went from now to, yes, I want to leave. I just don't want it. I, 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 Where are you going to go? Nowhere. I mean, no. I mean, I... We will never leave New York, but I, I would if I had my druthers. I, I would just pick the kids up and say we're going. You know, we're gonna go live in Somewhere. Africa for right. a while. We're gonna go live in Vietnam for a while. We're gonna go live in Sweden for a while. We're gonna go live in Ireland for a while. Um, and and I actually think. And then we're like, well, what are we going to do there? Um, and like, well, do we fly home once a month to go to, you know, take care of business or whatever? But I feel like if if I didn't have those other things to think about and James Wilkie weren't a high school student, we could do it. But James Wilkie's like, I don't want to live. I want to fit. I want to be in high school here. Yeah. He loves his school. Is he going to be in 10th grade? He'll be in 10th grade. Yeah. Yeah. That went fast. So no, we'll live in New York. You'll live in New yeah. York. Yeah. I can't I picture you living anywhere no. but New York. We'll never, we'll never leave New York. <laughs> no, I love New York. And speaking of New York, and if you don't want to talk about no, this, no, that's fine. Too, what? I just want to ask you about your old friend running for governor. Of New York. Oh yeah, isn't that can, something? Can I ask you? About yeah, yeah, that? yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. So how incredible! And it's nice to be asked the way you're asking. I've been accosted at parties with oh, people I don't know. Why is oh. she doing that? What does she know? How dare she? By women, only by women. Well, that's a whole other podcast. I'm like, what? And so, yes, I'm thrilled. Wow. I'm thrilled, and I'm surprised at. I'm surprised at how little 
time people are taking, those that object for whatever bizarre reasons, some of whom I've discovered don't even vote in New York. So I was like, why are you bothered by this? To learn about Cynthia, to know about who she is. You don't have to agree with her policy. You don't have to vote for her, but certainly take the time before you criticize the fact that she's boldly pursuing this. She knows that it She knew when she did it, it was going to be a challenge, you know, but she's been good. Everybody agrees she's been good for this conversation in the city. They now, they call it the Cynthia effect. It literally has been called the Cynthia effect. Like it's moved our governor to make some progressive choices, to get behind policy that is serving, some might say, a more progressive point of view, but many would argue is better for the city and the state. So when when these women come up and object, what are they actually objecting to? What does she know? Why isn't she just running for mayor? Why is she running for governor? I saw her on a talk show. She seemed ill-prepared. And I was like, wow. First of all, I was like, well, I will take the time, ma'am, and I will tell you a little bit about Cynthia Nixon. I've known her since I was 11 years old. That was the first time we worked together, or 12, or even, no, 11 or 12. She was born and raised in New York by a single mother, you know, fifth floor walk up, went to all public schools, got scholarships to public high schools, college, et cetera, Barnard, Columbia, whatever, has been an advocate her entire life, has been working on behalf of social justice causes, public, you know, funding for public schools, infrastructure, infrastructure issues. She's brilliant. She's, um, formidable, she's learned, and she's willing to learn. And she has a point of view about the city where she was born and raised, just like anybody else who might run for public office. (laughs) We don't typically question the provenance of the candidate so much. And we certainly didn't have the same standard for a gentleman who was elected president. And in a democracy, that is what happens. You cannot argue, right, right, with that. That's choice. Like, we have a choice. And she is running on the Democratic tip. You know, it's like for the primary, that's still the way we function. As of now, we still live in a democracy. <laughs> so that's been the that's been the objection. And I'm just surprised that after all the sort of the looking back at what happened in the twenty sixteen election and, you know, high you know, highly regarded journalists recognizing that the standard they held for candidate Clinton was very different than the standard they held for candidate Trump. And some are regretful about the way they conducted themselves in interviews or even just general coverage. And that here we are again with Cynthia. And I feel like we're doing it all over again. You don't have to vote for her. Why do you think that... But listen to what she's saying. Why do you think that there's such a visceral reaction to women, uh, you know, especially when they're changing their role or expanding their role. Yeah, no one says to a businessman who runs for elected office, what, what did you do? Like, why is why is a CEO any better equipped to talk about public policy on a local or state level right. than a woman who also actually was a business person? So what do you think it is? I just feel like it's a generational it's a it's a it's it's old fashioned thinking and i just think it's going to be moses and james wilkie and their friends and a generation that simply looks at gender and identity and class differently um at diversity i just feel like even women who call themselves evolved come up to me and to ask me why my colleague is running for public office. Why would you ever ask anybody? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not like they're saying, oh, oh, wow, you're running for public office? Tell me about what you're doing. No, it's like, why? Why is she taking up a space? Wow. But, you know, I don't, I, the, I don't expect any of this to change overnight. I just don't think we are capable. Even, you know, our better selves, the, you know, I, I just think it's going to be hard. Don't you? I do. I think. I mean, why do you think they respond so viscerally, viscerally to this, this kind of thing, at, per, for example? Well, you know, being a woman who, especially when I first started this business, there was such a visceral response and like such an angry response. 
Um, so I've, it's something that I've given thought to, you yeah. know, because I think that women in the public eye, I think that people become very comfortable with us, at, you know, representing a certain archetype, mm -hmm. as we were talking about mm -hmm. before, or mm -hmm. a certain paradigm of, of what a woman is. And I, I think that when a woman says, hey, I, I want to expand into the next iteration of who I am, and um, I think that for a lot of people, there's a sort of how dare you. Like, I don't, I don't know you like that. I don't right. like you like that. You were already doing something I was comfortable with, and now you're asking me right. to stretch past what I'm comfortable with. And I don't want you to have anything else. And, and I also think there's a misogyny under that kind of still runs underneath all women who, you know, are, stake a little flag in the ground and say, I know I'm going to do something that's outside of the box. I think yeah. people culturally yeah. have a hard time with that and that we as women have to fight at least twice as hard, probably yeah. 10 times as hard as a man does in our position mm -hmm. for legitimacy and to be taken seriously. And I, I really respect what Cynthia is doing. And I think it's Me too. amazing. I think she's so brave. And I watched her, you know, speak in her commercials and I just think, regardless of the outcome, A, she's definitely moving culture. She's changing conversations. Yep. yep. And she's so brave. And she remains very, in my opinion, there's something, you know, her focus is very clear. It's like, and I always feel reassured when a woman, like, you can feel her looking at the bullseye. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like she's going to kind of, whoever she is and whatever she's doing, she's going to help all women kind of go yeah. forward. And I think she's, um, you know, given voice to a lot of people in our city who, you know, really have felt, you know, underrepresented. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I, and, you know, if you ask her why she chose to, a gubernatorial seat to go after, because it isn't the conventional way to like, you know, climb the ladder. She's, she'll be very pointed and she'll say, because that's where the money is allocated from. That's 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 the purse strings, and I want I want to change the way we're spending taxpayer dollars in this in this state, and it's a like once again you might not agree with it, um, and you might not agree with the way she's laid it out and her business plan for this state for the great state of New York, but it's not without thought, and um, yeah, it's really brave. I'm enormously proud of her. Yeah, I love I love her. I'm so proud of her. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to keep you here all day, but oh, thank you so God, much. Thank you. What a fantastic thank chat. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining my conversation with Sarah Jessica Parker. You can check out her fiction imprint at sjpforhogarth.com. Their first novel, A Place for Us, is out now. That's it for this week's episode of the Goop Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please rate, review, and share with your friends. To keep up with new episodes, just hit subscribe. And for more info, head over to goop.com slash the podcast. See you next week.